This is Fortress on a Hill. Thank you for joining us. I'm Henry. And I'm Danny. We're here to tear apart recent stories about our nation's armed forces and our veterans. We hope you'll take a critical look at what's happening with our military. And we hope you enjoy the show. Now, let's get started. Tom Engelhart on the show. Um, for a quick bio, uh, Tom's a friend. Uh, he, he created and runs the TomDispatch.com website, which is a project of the Nation Institute, where he is a fellow. Uh, he is the author of a highly praised history of American triumphalism in the Cold War, or the end of the victory culture, which, interestingly enough, before I met Tom, was on my graduate school American history reading list at the University of Kansas. Uh, he also wrote a novel, The Last Days of Publishing, and collections of his Tom Dispatch interviews, Mission Unaccomplished. His newest book, which is just released, is a collection of poignant essays, and it's titled A Nation Unmade by War, which we'll talk about today. Uh, Tom Dispatch, is, uh, he's going to tell us about it, but it's the sideline that sort of took over his life uh, after he retired. Before that, he worked uh, as an editor at the Pacific News Service in the 70s, and for the last three decades as an editor in the book publishing industry uh, at Pantheon, where he edited and published award-winning works, which some of you have definitely heard of, uh, ranging from Art Spiegelman's Mouse, and John Dower's War Without Mercy, which was absolutely excellent. Uh, he's now a consulting editor at Metropolitan Books and a co-founder and co-editor of Metropolitan's The American Empire Project. He is married to Nancy Garrity, who I've been lucky enough to meet, a therapist, and has two children, Maggie and Will, and, and a grandson that he uh, spends most Fridays with. Uh, on a personal note, Tom uh, is the first publisher who really believed in me, at least in the article sense. And... Uh, I cold emailed him one day, and, and he reached back out to me and, and really started publishing my stuff. He made me a better writer. Uh, his edits are amazing, and I owe my burgeoning, if very modest, writing career uh, to him as much as anyone. So thanks again for being on, Tom. Well, great, Danny. I'm, I'm glad I did something in my life. <laughs> okay. If that's if that's the only thing you do, that, that would be that would be just fine. Uh, yeah, I don't think well, I, would that, I, would, I would still be proud if it was the only thing I did. Yeah. Uh, so let, let's talk about Tom Dispatch. I know that yeah. um, you and I have talked so many times, and uh, I've never gotten the full story. Um, but Tom Dispatch is a home for me and so many other great writers. Uh, Andy Basevich, who I've followed for years. Uh, it's just an amazing, unique site. So uh, if you could talk about that, sort of how you started the project and maybe the gap that you were trying to fill uh, in the mainstream media with Tom Dispatch. Well, what I would say is that, that even that description makes the process of starting Tom Dispatch far more rational than it was. I mean, here, here's, here's kind of the way I tell the story, I think. Um, I mean, let's start with 9-11. The, the day that it happened, I live in New York City, and when I grasped what was happening, that is, it wasn't like a, a plane by accident flying into a large building. Um, when I grasped what had gone on, I would say for a reasonably intelligent guy, I had one of the dumber thoughts on Earth, which was my first reaction at 9-11, when I understood it, was that maybe it would open this country up to the pain of the rest of the world, because, of course, this was not the sort of thing that went on in our country, but horrific things like this were happening elsewhere in the world. And that was a truly dumb stuff. You know, reaction. It couldn't have been stupider. So that's that's where Tom Dispatch really started. I I... I, when, within a, within a couple of days, the Bush administration had declared war on a small group of jihadis, and when they had decided it was going to be a, as they called it, global war on terror, and they began talking about taking on uh, terror groups in 60 countries, and their geopolitical dreams began to soar, and we began to, I began to see what was actually going on, I had a second reaction which was, I think, a lot smarter and more accurate, which was I had been very mobilized in the Vietnam era against that war. Um, it was, I thought, a terrible period. Um, and I, I, but I thought to myself, you know, this is going to be the worst period of my life, what's coming. I saw that what's coming was going to be truly bad. And I, and I, I as you said, I had, I, I have two kids, and I, I, I had been 
an editor doing perfectly good work. You know, I've been putting out wonderful books. I was proud of what I had done. But I had a feeling at that moment that I had to do something, that I could not hand this planet over to my kids, you know, my growing up kids, without doing something, without trying to do something. But I had no idea what. Now, somewhere in this period, because it happened very quickly, we began bombing um, Afghanistan. And I also, mind you, I was way behind on, I, I, I barely understood that on the Internet you could wander the world and look at things, but I began to see our, our media coverage began to close in in a way that even in the middle of the Cold War I had never seen. And we became, you know, there was one bad, horrific bad guy in the world, Osama bin Laden, and we became the one, you know, the lone survivor, victim survivor and future conqueror, you might say. And the rights around all this in ballparks and everywhere else began to multiply, and they never seemed to end. And somewhere in that period, I read a piece, an article, by an Afghan refugee who was living here. He was living in California. It was a piece that I think the website Counterpunch, which I barely knew at that moment. And I still remember what stunned me about it. It was, it was the bombing of Afghanistan had just begun. But if you remember, we had had a war. You know, we had had a, a long war, war number one, Afghan war number one, American-Afghan war number one against Afghanistan, uh, 1979 to 1989. Uh, and then Afghanistan had had a horrific civil war. And he said what we were doing was bombing the rubble. And that image stunned me. And I took that image. I barely knew how to BCC anything. Uh, but I took that image. I put it in part of the piece in an email, I put a bunch of friends and relatives on, you know, on it, and I sent it off basically with a line saying, hey, you've got to read this. And then I began to become obsessed, and I started, I suddenly realized I could wander the world. I could read Le Monde Diplomatique. I could read in English, and I could read The Guardian. I could read whatever. And I began just gather. I didn't even know what I was doing. I began gathering pieces. Um, and if you go to Tom Dispatch and read it, you, as you know well, I do little introductions to each piece. And that really happened because I started the line that, hey, you've got to read this line, began to develop into little introductions. While I was still doing pieces that were elsewhere, I would do a couple of paragraphs and, with a link. Um, and, it, and, and then the, the miracle of the Internet began, which was people began wanting to come on the list. Journalists started writing and saying, can I be on your list? Susan Sontag wrote me. I went, oh, my God, you know, what's happening? And suddenly I had a list of 400 people, and I was sending this thing out. And at that moment, the Nation Institute, which you mentioned, suggested to me that maybe they can put this online. And it became Tom Dispatch. And at that moment, I also realized I've been working with wonderful authors for years, people like Chalmers Johnson. Um, and I suddenly realized that they, too, wanted to do things. I started to ask them if they would write for me. And I stopped copying pieces around the world, and I started doing original stuff that was meant to provide another framework than the tight, you know, than the, the almost blind framework, media framework in which we were living in, in, in the rest of 2001 and, and thereafter. And that became Tom Dispatch. That's really what happened, and I've been doing it I would say reasonably obsessively for almost 16 years now, something like that, and um, and 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 you stumbled into it, and, and are now I... a regular and are now a regular author. And it's really changed everything because one of the really awesome parts about Tom Dispatch is that you get such traction with other websites at this point. I guess from your connections yeah. in publishing and just uh, yeah. a lifetime of sort of activism. It's it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's a modest, in terms of actual readership at Dispatch, it's a modest website. You know, thousands of people, but not huge thousands. But, but the pieces, uh, because I want them to be, get reposted all over the Internet. So, I mean, I have no idea how big the audience is, but it is remarkably large. Yes, for, for, for what I hope to be an alternate view of our world, and particularly our world of, and this is kind of in a way where you and Chris come in, um, American wars. The wars that began then and have never, never, never ended, and, and, and show no sign of ever ending. 
Now, it's unclear if they will end, and that's one of the more yeah. disturbing parts. The, the good news for Tom Dispatch is there'll always be plenty to write about. The bad news is it's for the planet. <laughs> yes, it's true. It's true. I should, I, should, I should thank my lucky stars that we, we continue to fight forever wars across the planet and, and spread terror groups and so on and so forth. Thank God for Tom Dispatch. <laughs> uh, so, there we are. Recently, Danny and I were discussing the injury that most Americans felt when 9-11 took place, you know, and, and that varied, you know, there's a, there's a spectrum in there between people who saw it and were there like you and, and felt it because it was your home all the way out to people like me who love my country and just, you know, felt that pain and then lived it in the military over the next six or seven years. So uh, an article of yours, uh, Doing Bin Laden's Bidding, um, discussed how the attack, which, which was absolutely horrific in his own right, never truly challenged American power. You know, and there was nothing about our society that was in danger of being ripped apart by that single action. And the idea that 19 Saudis with 400 grand, I love how you use that stat in articles, by the way, um, came to New York City and pushed us into a war is a farce pushed by the same people who've kept the war machine running for long after the time to conduct any prudent action against terrorism in the Middle East. So my, my thought to you is, it, do you think this long after it happened that the mainstream media consensus about September 11, 2001 can be changed? Could there be some kind of reset when the newest generation, you know, uh, Sam's little boy and my boys come of age, who didn't actually live 9-11, could, could there be a shift in that? Uh, that's a, that's a, I mean, you know, it's funny. I think, actually, that the real shift that's needed, and I have my doubts about, I mean, who, who, you know, the wonderful thing about the future is we humans are terrible at predicting the future. All you have to do is go back and look at our, you know, imagined futures in the 19th or early 20th century, and you know that we're awful at it. So let, let me say that there is always hope that there can be kind of a reboot of the past in the future. I think that the reboot that has to happen is really the reboot not of day one, not of 9-11, but really of 9-12, 9-13. In other words, I, I think it, it was, you know, I, I've never forgotten, uh, I think, the most striking looking back moment, I mean, that, that we, of course, didn't know then, but we know now, was Donald Rumsfeld, who was the Secretary of Defense, standing in the rubble of the Pentagon. Uh, I mean, he probably wasn't literally in the rubble, but if you remember one of the scout part of the Pentagon, and he was somewhere there. He, he, as as they were figuring, he was he had already he already I think understood what had happened that it was Osama bin Laden, that it was Al Qaeda, and so on and so forth. But he turned to his aides, and one of his aides wrote this down, and we have it. It's like you can Google it anywhere. He said, I said, the phrase almost word for word is, he turned to his head and he said, sweep it up, all up. And what that meant was not just Osama bin Laden, but, you know, they had a thing about Saddam Hussein, the guy who ran Iraq. And he meant, we're not just going to do, it's not just Osama bin Laden, we're going to do something much bigger. And you could, you could see that from that moment, that was the beginning of the global war on terror. Those guys, you know... I mean, that moment shocked them, and as they recovered from their shock, they saw a kind of weird possibility. They believed that we were the last superpower, and that we potentially, with the American military, could do anything. And this is what needs to be rebooted. You look 17 years later, and almost 17 years later, and you can see that the U.S. military, it turns out, could do almost nothing across the planet, and I assume we're going to talk more about this. But I think the reboot might be to go back and to look at that event and say, wait a minute, you know, we were goaded by a kind of genius, Osama bin Laden. I mean, he was a, he was a, a kind of, I, I, I used to think of him as a kind of a Dallas wizard because he used almost nothing. You said that $400,000, whatever it was that he actually spent in 19, you know, suicidal hijackers. He used that to goad us into by now, according to the Watson Institute at Brown, spending $5.6 trillion, including veterans care in the future, on our wars. You know, I mean, dumping it into a sinkhole, and I'm sure we'll get to this, you know, to 
remarkably no purpose whatsoever, or uh, an utterly negative purpose. And that, I think it's that that I, I hope will be rebooted, but I, I, I fear, and this is something I know we're going to get to, I fear that Americans are, at least our generation of Americans, even though you guys are in the military, our generation of Americans are so divorced from the military that, I mean, on the whole, with the rare exceptions of places like Tom Dispatch, we're paying remarkably little attention to our wars, Yeah. to what's actually happening. Let me stop there. Well, that's great. I mean... I... 912 is, and I wrote a piece for you about we sort of what if, you know, a better strategy. And, you know, I was yeah. my first crack at it, and I'm not sure it was yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. a perfect strategy, but it was better than what we got. But, you know, Henry and I, you know, uh, me and Chris, you know, our lives changed so much on 912 too, and we probably couldn't have even forecasted what it really meant for us as guys who were either, yeah. uh, in my case, just in the military. Uh, Henry, you, were, you, were, you came in soon after, right? Yeah, on nine, uh, nine, nine thirteen, I was sitting in MEPS in front of the big TVs so, watching. So, I mean, you, you are an even better example, Henry, in the sense that you literally were one of the nine eleven recruits. I mean, yeah, one of the motivated nine eleven yeah. recruits. Yeah. And who could have forecasted these seventeen years? It's it's remarkable, and it's it's almost scary how effective Bin Laden was. I wonder if he could have even foreseen that we would have been so stupid. You know, that we would have been. Oh so no, I, no, I, I, I mean, he clearly. I all I would say about Bin Laden is he clearly had some intuitive sense of American thinking, of official thinking in Washington and how it worked. Because I think he did understand that this it was meant as a horrific coding. And of course, those towers coming down, all the dead civilians and everything else. You know, he probably initially didn't even believe that it had worked so well in terms of exactly what they wanted. And But then I think in some sense, that, that he always, his thing was, he knew that if he could involve us in his world, we would create for him what he could never do for himself. And what we've done over these last 16 or 17 years, which is to create, create the conditions for the spread of al-Qaeda-like movements, which is exactly what we've done for 16 or 17 years now. I mean, and they're everywhere. Sure. They've, pr they've proliferated absolutely everywhere. They're everywhere. I mean... I mean, it was a teeny little group. There might have been a, you know, a few thousand followers, something like that. I mean, and, and we think of them as being in Afghanistan, but there were a few in Hamburg and wherever else. Um, it, but it was, it was a teeny group. And now you think about it, at the, the mightiest military on earth, the CIA, everything else, the American intelligence outfits, all 17 of them, you know, so many years later, more than a decade and a half later, and the original al-Qaeda still exists. There's Al Qaeda, you know, Al Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula. There's Al Qaeda in the Maghreb, which is, uh, you know, the Sahara, the, the nor northern Africa. There's, and of course, we're not. That's without even getting to ISIS, whose caliphate is gone, but it's now a global brand. I mean, the the, the bombings in Indonesia the other day were by families who were seemingly ISIS families, but the destruction of the city of Marawi in the Philippines was, you know, by people associated with. I mean, in other words. In other words, I mean, in a way, the global war on terror turned out to be a kind of strange global war for terror. Yeah, absolutely. Or so I see it. I think you're absolutely right. And so now it is 17 years later, which kind of brings us to your new book, uh, A Nation Unmade by War, uh, which you guys should really pick up. Uh, I was lucky enough to get an early copy. You know, this is a collection of your essays, which you've done before, Tom, um, to great effect. And I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, if, if you were telling someone why they should read this book, wh what's the thematic glue that holds together this, this group of, you know, very diverse essays? You know, it's 17 years after 9-12, or almost 17 years after 9-12. What are you trying to communicate to the reader with this group of essays? Well, I think the thing I'm trying to say to the reader is, you know, it's time for Americans again to look at their, to pay some attention to our wars. You know, I, I mean, I was struck to give you an example. Um, the, the, you know, the so-called liberation of Afghanistan, the invasion of 2001. By 2000, by early 2002, the Taliban, because we didn't just go after al-Qaeda, we went after the Taliban. The Taliban had been driven from the last provincial capital that they held in Afghanistan. Sixteen-plus years later, last week, the Taliban took for a day and a half a provincial capital in Afghanistan. So 
16 years of American, we've had up to 100,000 or more troops there. I mean, Danny, you were there. I, I, I don't know, Chris, about you, but Danny, I know you were there. I mean, we've had, we've had, you know, we've had hundreds of thousands of troops pass through there. We've brought in our air power. We've brought in everything. And, you know, we could not defeat the Taliban. They have more territory. They're stronger today than they were, you know, in sometime in 2002 when they were actually ready to lay down their arms. But that's another story. Um, I mean, the striking, the, 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 you know, the, the striking thing about, and I think we'll probably get into this in some of your other questions, but the striking thing about this country is, you know, once upon a time, Americans mobilized when it came to wars, either for or against them. World War II, I was born July 20th, 1944. This country was mobilized. My father was in the army overseas. My mother was working to, to, to support the military effort here. You know, she was, I mean, that's another story, but, but they were mobilized. The Vietnam years, I mean, these were still, these, this was a citizen's army. It was a draft army, and we were all mobilized in those years. We, people were mobilized both in the army and, and and out of it against the war. But, you know, I would say the single most important act, to my mind, and it's something I go into in the book, of of this era, of the, of the previous era, was Nixon's decision in 1973 against the urge of the even the military high command, which was worried about how they would get troops, to end the draft. The ending of the draft separated the American people from their wars and their military, and it's allowed that military to continue to fight year after year after year, and to fight in the, the strangest wars. I mean, I mean, this is a, uh, this is, we are talking about a great imperial power, and we do not see many examples of great imperial powers, historically, who at the height of their power can't use their military to impose a kind of control on parts of the world. I mean, it might be a brutal, ugly control, but control. It turns out the lesson of the 16 years, war after war after war, conflict after conflict at least, is we can, we, our military can, can impose, in essence, nothing successfully anywhere. And Washington is incapable or unwilling to learn that lesson, and the American people are paying, in essence, no attention. My book is about what happens when you are in such a situation, and when, because this is the nature of wars, the wars begin to come home. They begin to come home in all sorts of complicated ways, whether it's talking, we're talking about militarizing the police or putting drones over the homeland or, 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 or even using that word homeland, which was a word Americans would never have used until post 9/11. Our, our our world is changing in complicated ways. We would not have Donald Trump as president if we had not had these wars. I'm convinced of that. I mean, it's hard to even explain how America is being unmade by wars. Although one thing is obvious, which is that, that the trillions of dollars that have gone into our wars have not gone into infrastructure and all sorts of other things. Um, but, uh, but 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 so I would say my book is literally its title. It's 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 how to what to think about a nation that is being slowly unmade by war. I mean, we are unmaking other nations overseas. And I mean, one of the things from that moment that I told you about when I first thought about bombing rubble, I mean, I have been fascinated by the, the word rubble. I wanted to bring rubbleize into the language because across significant stretches of the world, we, with the help of, in this case, ISIS or whoever, uh, ISIS bomb makers and so on and so forth. We have been destroying major cities. We've destroyed Mosul, Raqqa, Raqqa, which was the so-called capital of the Islamic uh, states, the Islamic state's capital, according to you know uh, the figures I've seen. Twenty thousand bombs were dropped on by the U.S. Air Force in a few uh, hours. Um, it, it, nothing standing. I mean, there's still buildings standing, but nothing is nothing is untouched. You know, but across significant parts of the world, we responded to those thousands of innocent civilians who died in 9-11 by, in essence, piling up one tower after another. Thousands of dead civilians, displaced people everywhere, you know, refugees at a level that we've never seen since the end of World War II and so on and so forth. This is the result 
not just of this country, but significantly of this country's wars. And that is a story that cries out to be told. Thank you for joining us today. Please come join the conversation at www.fortressonahill.com. You can also find us on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill or on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash Fortress on a Hill. We want to hear from our listeners about the topics and issues pertinent to America's military and veteran communities. And last but certainly not least, analyze your news and its sources very closely. Verify everything you read. And remember that no one, no matter how powerful, are above criticism, especially those with the power to send others into harm's way. We'll see you next time.